Hello everyone, welcome, welcome to Community Corner. I am your host, Mr. I'm Ryan, Ryan Nicholas Gray. Uh, okay. Oh, my name is David Drittillo. I'm your co-host, also. Our guest today is Ms. Vicki Suter. She is the Oakland Communication and Educational Manager for the, o for the Oakland County Mental Health Authority. Let's welcome Vic Ms. Ms. Suter. Vicki, thanks for coming down, Ms. Suter. Thanks for having me. Please, please tell us about your parents. My parents, well, I actually grew up in Monroe, which is, is south of Oakland County near the Ohio border. And my parents, I'm from a blue collar family. My father spent his whole working career at Ford Motor Company in Monroe at an assembly plant. He retired from there and my mother was a homemaker. They had eight children and she did some part-time work in retail. She's now retired. My father's been passed away for some time, but Good parents, lots of siblings. We we had Mine, fun. Go ahead, became she answered my question too already. And t t tell us about your tell us about your family. My family. I have two sons, who are in their twenties, about the same age as you two probably. They both have their own homes, live near us, not too far from us in Ferndale. My mm. oldest son is a hairstylist in Berkeley. His name is Christopher. And my younger son is a chemical engineer. He has a, a degree from Wayne State University. He works for a company selling chemicals. And they're David? great kids, love them. David, have a question, a question for Mr. Sutter? Yes, I do. Oh, I have to repeat this again. Sorry. Where did, you, where did you live growing up? I lived in Monroe, which is a small community, rural community in South Michigan, just outside of the mm -hmm. Ohio border in Monroe County. Ryan, thank you, David. Thank you. What schools did you What schools did you attend? Good question. I was raised Catholic, so I spent my ah. life in Catholic school. So, as as a young person, I went to St. Anne's Catholic Elementary School, which is now closed, has been closed for a number of years. But our whole family, all my siblings, went to that school, and many of my cousins. So we helped support that school for a long time. After that, I went to St. Mary's Academy, which was an all-girls school Ooh. that is in Monroe. Ooh. And that's where I, and then I went to Monroe Community College, mm -hmm. graduated from there. After that, I went to Wayne State University, both for my bachelor's degree and my MBA. David? And Ryan, what did you want to be when you grow, grew up? What did I want to be when I grew up? Well... I think probably a teacher. I was thinking about teaching or to be in some type of business. So teaching didn't work out as I became an adult. So I have a degree in business and, and work for the, the authority now. Hi, Ian. Thank you, David. How did you arrive at your current, at your current career choice? <laughs> Oftentimes careers choose you. I was not necessarily looking to work in mental health. I was in my mid-twenties and I had gotten married and moved, into, moved to Oakland County, so I was looking for a job. At the time, I had worked for the front of the court in Monroe County, and so I was trying to get into the Oakland County system, but that didn't quite work out and I got hired into mental health. I applied to the county system for a job and got hired into mental health, and that was 19 years ago. And I've just held a variety of jobs mm. with Oakland County CMH, enjoyed every one of them uh, to my current position. David? Ryan, please tell us about the Oakland County Mental Health Authority. The Oakland County Community Mental Health Authority is the public mental health system for Oakland County. And what that okay. means is that we provide public services to individuals who meet our eligibility criteria so individuals who have a development disability, okay. whether that's a physical or a cognitive disability, persons who have a severe mental illness, and children who have a serious emotional disturbance. So folks that don't have private insurance or their illness is so severe that they're not able to work and it's a disability, they can get services through us to help them in the recovery or to get the quality of life that they're looking for. Ryan, David, th thank you, David. What groups of people do you help? 
We help adults and kids who have an, a, a developmental disability. Okay. So that, that could be somebody who has cerebral palsy or uh, mental mm. retardation. Uh, they, they can come to us. We help them um, lead as independent lives as they, they possibly mm. can. Also for adults who have a serious mental illness. And that could be, when I talk about a serious mental illness, that might be something like clinical depression okay. or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And then we also help children who have a serious emotional disturbance. So kids, uh, any age, up to 18, who are having difficulties with the mental illness and their parents, and they need some assistance to get them into re on, on their way to recovery and getting the life that they want and leading the life that they choose. David? Ryan, please tell us about your job with the Community Mental Health Authority. Well, I'm the officially the communication education manager mm -hmm. and what that means is that we educate the community about what the public mental health system does and who we are and where we're at and where people can get services we also do education about disabilities making sure that our community understands what a disability is and what it isn't that people with disabilities have have many talents and abilities and they can do many things. So we try to educate our community and open opportunities for people to do the things that they want in their community, to have social equity, is, is, which is part of our mission. And social equity means that individuals with a disability can do all the things that you and I enjoy, going to the movies, belonging to a church, having a job, dating, whatever it is that, that folks enjoy. So. That's what I do. I love my job. I get to interact with a lot of different folks. I get to teach people how to do speeches, to, to talk effectively when they're, they're telling their stories. It's a great job. Ryan, thank you, David. Anyway, as we, as you, as we mentioned, you are the communication and education, and education manager of the, of the agency. How did, you, how did you come to hold this job? Well, <laughs> I'll give you the short version. Okay. I actually have been with the agency for 19 years and held a variety of positions. And I have an MBA, a Master's in Business Administration from Wayne mm. State University. And in, in 2000, 1999, 2000, our organization was looking to reorganize and do things in a different way. And at the time, I was okay. part of our Human Resources Department. And so we all had to apply for our jobs. Uh, my job was being eliminated, so I had to apply for a job, and I did. I applied for some management positions, and I was chosen for communications and education, I guess because I have a fun personality. Yes, you do, Vicki. Ellen, <laughs> have a question for Vicki. Ryan, question for Vicky do you have any special education or prior experience working with the, the handicapped before joining the agency? No, I, not really. I, 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 when I, I joined the agency when I was in my mid-twenties, so it's been a long time. And I had, was going to college and raising my kids at the time and had a job for, with the front of the court in Monroe County. So my main experience with someone with a disability was I have a cousin who has muscular dystrophy and she's been in a wheelchair for a number of years, but I never really thought of her as having a disability. Probably one of the smartest persons I know. She's a lawyer just a really nice, great person. She was just my cousin. I never thought of, of her having a disability. So that's the extent of my experience, if you want to say, with a person with a disability Why before I got the question? job. Yes, David. Thank you, David. We know, we'd like to know about your role in this agency with the Ability to Vote Committee. Well, there again, I have a really fun part of my job. And I've come together with a whole group of people, including Ryan and David, to form a group called Ability to Vote 2008. And what we're looking to do is really encourage, inspire, and support people with disabilities to get out and vote. Sometimes folks don't think that their vote counts, or they don't know enough to vote, or people are telling them, well, you, you really shouldn't vote, or don't worry about voting. And so they may not think about it. They may not think that I should be out voting, but really all of us, including people's, people with disabilities, and people of all levels of abilities should vote. It is just our human right, our, our right as a U.S. citizen 
to get out and vote. And I particularly all my life have made sure I, I go vote. Sometimes I'm not all that passionate about the issues or about the candidates. It doesn't matter. My forefathers fought and gave their life. And our, and our people fighting in Iraq still give their lives right. for our freedom in, in this country to go vote. You know, we represent a democracy we do. and that we all have a right to choose our elected officials and choose our public policy. And we have to be a part of that. Right. I, one of the things I say is if you don't go vote, you don't have the right to complain because you haven't participated in the process. If you voted, go ahead and complain because you were part of the process. But if you choose just not to even vote, don't complain. But we have to make sure that we, we, we exercise that right. Can you imagine this country if, if our rights of voting was taken away? We didn't get to choose our leaders and our, our leaders were just, were just put upon us. Right. So we have to be sure that we exercise that. Particularly for myself as a woman, we weren't originally given rights to vote. Women were not given rights, a right to vote originally. Of so women, women had to fight for that. So I, I make sure I get and out and vote. Of Everybody should do that. Mentioned, there's a woman named Susan B. Anthony, who was, historically speaking, she was the first woman, David, who gave women the right to vote because women couldn't vote in the 1800s. What well, was that? Probably in the 1800s. They couldn't vote at all. Until that woman said, hey, wait a minute. Women can vote now. And today, that woman. Give me that, what Vicky just talk, talked about. Can you have a question? question? Uh, Vicky? And who I am? Yes, sir? How, how were the members of this committee chosen? Well, the members of our work group were chosen by folks who really have a passion about voting, about election, about making sure that people that are served through the public mental health system, people that have a disability, okay. know that they have a right to vote, are encouraged to vote. And I knew you two have, have a passion about that and, and are, are great speakers Thank and you. are fun guys. Thank you. So we certainly wanted to have you folks as, as part of our work group. So we have, and we've asked different agencies to be part of that work group to help us spread the word, to help us to support people with disabilities, to, to encourage them to get registered to vote, to go out and vote, try to help with transportation, try to break down the barriers that they might have or they think they have to getting out to vote. You know, Vicki, you know, Vicky, you know, I've been voting all my life, Vicki and David. I've been voting all my life, Vicki. And I can tell you, David, that I love voting. It's important because, you know, when my dad and I go to vote sometimes, David, when you go when I go up to Hugger Elective School to go and vote, I can tell you I I walk into the voting poll every day. My, when I go to vote with my dad once in a while. My dad when it comes to be coming in, uh, time time to go and vote, I can stack and be in the poll my, my, the polling booth, fill out the ballot, and my dad is helping me because you know it's hard to understand you know, what the proposals are, what they what what are the real issues on the ballot. And I'm glad Vicky is helping me learn that thing. I'm glad you're helping me teaching that stuff because, you know, it's hard for me to understand I have that. a hard question for Vicki. Let me, let me just respond to Ryan here for a minute. Okay. I think Ryan makes a good point. You don't have to, to be intimidated about going to vote. You're right. Because if you think you need some support or you need some help in, at the voting booth or when you go sign up to vote, you can have that. So when you go to the polling sites and you sign up and you show your ID, if you don't have someone there who can assist you, That's right. you can ask one of the poll workers, That's right. can you help me through this process? What do I need to do next? Where do I go? Where do I put my ballot? Exactly. Do right. you need to see my ID? And they will assist you. They can. So, you know, the first time I went to vote, I didn't really know what I was supposed to do either. You know, like I, tell you, I, feel but, the same because, I feel the same because, you know, it is so hard for many, for many American citizens to vote because Aaron Castle, because he was the first person who is now officially registered to vote because now he can go vote now. That's great. He exercised his, his right to vote. And we've all had a first time to go vote, right? I, I can tell you, I, I voted in 2000 when George W. Bush, it was Al Gore and George W. Bush. I voted in an election, it was hard. I had to go and vote nothing because I had to think about it. I'd say, right, okay, who do you want as president? I said, well, George W. Bush. And, and, then, and when and my, then, my own sons turned 18, I said, be sure you register to vote. You need to be a registered voter. They did do that. And the first time they had to go mm -hmm. vote, they had some questions about it, and we just talked about it. Even now, as we go vote in major elections and there's different issues on the ballot, my husband will talk to me about, well, what do you think about that? What does this proposal really mean? Mm -hmm. You have to, Sometimes you can read thing, things in the paper mm -hmm. about what the proposals, what the, what the candidate stands for. You can go to different websites. 
and I also continue to have conversations with my sons. I you know, do you support websites. this? Do you not several support this? Right. John McCain's website mm -hmm. and Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama. I'll tell you, Vicky, I have seen anything on the news about you know, like Barack Obama saying, "Well, you want to do this for America, we're going to change America, we're make America better." Why don't you make you out question it? All right. Because you want time here. What does the what does the voting committee want to do for 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 the public? Well, what we're looking to do is to make sure that everyone in our community has an opportunity to vote, if they so choose. I mean, you have the choice of not to vote, but we don't want people to vote because they're intimidated or they're afraid, or people around them are saying, well, don't, don't vote because you don't really know what's going on, or because they don't have transportation, or because they're afraid to go to the polls because they don't know exactly what the steps are to do. <laughs> so we're trying to provide some education in those areas, if people need education, don't understand it, we're going to have different activities that will help them learn about that, become more comfortable with it. One of the major endeavors that we're trying to do, and we haven't quite figured it out yet, is, is how can we match people who are willing to volunteer to take people to their, their polling sites and individuals who need help getting there. So somehow coming up with a database, working with community groups to say, can you be volunteers? Would you be willing to take somebody that's in your, your area to the polls. The way I look at it, we're all going to go vote, so it's not that hard for us to bring somebody with us okay. and give them the opportunity to vote as well. Do you have a question? Do I am? I said you. There are barriers to, to voting that the disabled or handicapped are confronted with that the general public does not face. Can you, Ricky, give us examples of such barriers? I sure can, David. Sometimes, for example, people who have some mobility issues that might be in a wheelchair or use a walker or use crutches, there may be some difficulties getting into the polling site. And so they need to contact their, their city clerk and make sure that their precinct is accessible to them. If it is not accessible to them, that, uh, that, pre that city clerk has to give them a precinct that would be accessible to them. So they may want to check ahead of time because sometimes the precincts are in older buildings, they're not as accommodating as some of the newer buildings. So that's, that's one barrier. Sometimes individuals may have a difficulty standing in line for a long time. And as we come up to this presidential election, I'm hoping that generally people will be out to vote in large numbers. And if that's the case, sometimes if you go during peak hours, you might have a long line. So you might think about going non-peak hours. I usually try to go as soon as the polls open because I go to work early, so I, I like to get in there early. So you can consider that. If you can't do that and you need to go and the lines are long and you're not able to stand, again, you could ask the poll workers, could I have a seat? I, I have you know, a, a difficulty standing for a long time. Sometimes folks don't like to be in crowds. And if that's the case and you really don't want to go to the, the election mm -hmm. site, the poll, to vote, you can always do an absentee ballot vote. And you need to contact the county clerks or your city clerks to get the application for that and submit it. And then you, can, you get an absentee ballot mailed to you. You complete that and send it in or drop it off to your city clerk. David? Thank you, sir. What barriers to voting that, that the disabled have are confronted, confronted with in the general public that, that does not face? Can you give us some examples of such barriers? Because I've seen like so many barriers in Michigan, like the proposals. There are certain things that I am trying to get over, trying to face in my life, and there are some things I really want. You make a good point, Ryan. Sometimes the the way the proposals are worded are difficult for all of us to okay, understand. Let me give you an example of one. Mm -hmm. I was reading an election one year, OPC, and he said, "Do you or do you not want the minibuses running?" And I said, How "Yes." About Wawa. Yeah, rah ra, ra. We have rah ra because they're a recreation department. Because they're important to us. They, but Ron told me when she came back that I made two rah down. I certainly did. The point. They did. OPC, you have OPC and you use the buses. Those are things, all things are important. Right, you really have to pay attention to the way the, the proposals are worded. Because worded. sometimes they, you, they're, you think they're worded so that you'd want to support them, but they're really in reverse. And instead of voting yes for what you want, you should really be voting no. So you, you have to be careful. 
a good way to understand the proposals is they a lot of times your local papers will cover issues. Local press or Detroit right. News or the I Daily guess, Tribune well, in my area. Well, I, guess, I, I did a centric, those are papers. They'll do yeah. some information about what the proposals they voters, mean. They talk about kinds of things on their website. Say, I've read hundreds of things. About I think voting. you could probably talk to the League of Women Voters. They're very yeah. involved with yeah. the election and what's occurring. Okay. I think you can talk to family members and friends. I what does this I really mean? Neighbors. <laughs> lots neighbors. Of things. Yes. It's it's okay to talk about the issues. Any, anything, your moms and dads, grandparents, anybody. Right. My husband always asks me, "What does this mean? What should I vote?" Really? <laughs> yes. Because okay, because when my dad comes with his Ryan, yeah, I said, "Dad, can you explain? Can you explain proposals to me?" His well, son, this what proposal means. I think he can have explained this to me so I can understand it better. Right. And on on most ballots. There's local proposals and there's statewide proposals. Millages, all kinds of so things. So your local proposals, not everybody's dealing with. It may just be somebody just in your community. So in Ferndale, we where I live, we may have something on related to Ferndale, related to our library or something like that on our ballot that might not be on any I other see, city's I, ballot. I, I, so. I live in Oakland Township. I live in Oakland County, Oakland Township. I live in Rochester, Rochester Hills. What happens when I go to vote? A proposal that says they have a millage like, do you want you have this OPC not be run, run anymore. Right. And I had to vote well, and I say yes. And think about it. Do you want to vote yes or no? I said yes, because OPC is a wonderful service. It really is important to me. Which I OPC is the Older Persons? Yes, yes it is. Come Older Persons Commission. It's older Persons Commission. It's important to us. Now, speaking of transportation, Vicki, transportation always seems an issue for the disabled or handicapped, and even the elderly. Transportation is an issue for individuals that don't have, on their own vehicle, don't have their own transportation. Public transportation in Oakland County is difficult, in, in Michigan in general, is really limited. Is. You know, I tell you, there I've are seen hundreds of people who, like you, who are not able to go to vote David, because I've seen my, fr my, friend, my friends on my street, David, where I live. There are hundreds of people, David, who can't even go and vote. There's, I'm you, men, right. women, and children who can't Well, that's vote part of what, what our work group is working on, Ability to Vote work group is working on, is, yeah. is trying to come up with some community transportation that will assist people to get to the polls. Thanks, sir. Many of the senior citizen programs in the si different various cities have a transportation program. There is some public transportation out there. Our hope is to make sure people are all aware of that. You might also talk to members of your church or your temple or your synagogue who you know uh, go vote and say, hey, could you think you could give me a ride to the polls or a neighbor? And if those things don't work, we're also looking to try to get some community groups involved like the Rotary, the Kiwanis Club, private industry to say, hey, we will volunteer and help people get to the okay. polls. Access, accessibility to voting precincts or even voting machines can, uh, can also be a barrier for many people. Can you give us some examples of 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 some of some of the of, of of such barriers? Because I can tell you, I've seen like hundreds of voting machines, sure. and they can't even get to them. And it should become they, accessibility. They, they do not have issue. a special machine for individuals who have a disability who maybe have a sight a sight difficulty, or if you're not not able to read, and that's okay. Again, I say you just ask for assistance. If you're not able to read the ballot or understand what you're supposed to do, ask one of the, the persons at the election site to assist you. There's also now uh, Automark. The Automark, thanks. The Automark. Automark machine. Every precinct should have one of those, and you should ask the poll workers about Why don't that. They? How can they should? I think it's required in Michigan. Yeah, Ricky. I tell you, Ricky, I have a, a hugger, David. I can. I'm not seeing one. Our market machine and precinct at all. I agree. Well, it's new. It's new. new, I, new. I, I, I'm in a small precinct, you are? and they, they have one. They have one in my precinct. You know, I wish they had touch screen voting. Where you, just, you could touch the machine and say, well, I love this person, that person. It would make it easier. That's true. Lots of people ask, why should we vote? Can you tell us some answers to this question? I think I mentioned before, I think it's just our, our right as citizens right. and everyone should exercise that to be a full citizen. Thanks, Aaron. And we should encourage those folks around us to exercise that. So one of the simple things that we can do, if you know somebody with a disability or know someone who's not voted, encourage them. Say, get registered to vote. Let, this is exciting. We get to elect a president, the, the leader of the greatest nation in the <laughs> world. We get to be a part of that. 
So I, get registered, go vote, figure out how to get there. We'll, our work group will assist you as well. I'm going to ask Clay Cooper. All right, David, what do people need to do to, reg to register to vote? Well, you have to be officially registered in Michigan to, to vote. So if you don't know that you're registered, you can go I to am. the Michigan.gov website. There is a spot there where you can see if you're, th you're th registered. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks. And then you need to complete the application, submit it to your county clerks. Oakland County Community Mental Health Authority, we have applications there. We have to provide the ability for people to register. And then you'll get your register card, tell you which precinct that you're, you go vote in. And the next election, you just go vote. You do have to register 30 days before an election to be eligible. How can a clerk office help people who want to vote? I think they can answer your questions. They can give you a copy of the ballot once it's put out. Libraries Speaking also of have that, copies of I ballots. I called my town clerk, mm -hmm. and they are going to give me a ballot, sample ballot. They're going to give you a sample ballot. Good. I'm, I'm on the list. They can tell you the procedure on how you need to register, where your precinct is, where it's located, is it accessible? Thank you, Aaron. We're almost out of time, so I'll ask one more question and then All we'll right. Well, actually, I, I, I have to have it up with this. So I'll ask, my, I'll ask, I'll ask <coughs> a couple more questions for you. Ryan. Thank you for being with us today and for all your energy you do on your behalf, Vicki. For your big nose with the green system. My name is David Dutel. I'm your co host. I think you will join us today and our host. I am right, Mr. Ryan Nicholas. We're hoping you and yours have a wonderful <coughs> voting season. And remember, people, Voting is important. Exercise your right to vote. Right. Get out and vote. It's important. Right, Have right. your voice be heard because if you because if you because if you vote, <coughs> then no one's gonna know you're gonna vote at all. I right. everyone say two things here. Saint Vicky sent mentioned about websites. You can we will post a website for your people out there that you can go up to check for further for information. The website is www www.michigan.gov/vote. Also, for about women, League for Women for Always of Michigan. We'll be also putting this website on www.lwvmichigan.gov. And I invite Erin Castle. Erin Castle. Erin Castle. Castle. Castle on the show for us today. Vicky Sutter, please stand up. Vicky Sutter. I'm David Taylor. I'm Mr. Ryan Gusco for you and yours. This is our Bet LA Shirts. This is our, our, our voting show. This is in the, as high voice before 2008. My shirts. And it's important to remember you all get out and vote. That's vote. Right. Vote is important. Bye.